Welcome to the Illustrator Studio. I am Jesse Kowalski, Curator of Exhibitions at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The Illustrator Studio is a weekly interview series, a project of the museum's Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. In this episode of the Illustrator Studio, we welcome Etienne Delassere. An award-winning illustrator, Swiss-born Delassere moved to Paris at the age of 21 to pursue a career as an art director for magazines and advertising agencies. Just a few years later, he emigrated to the United States and quickly found work creating art for magazines and children's books. Since that time, he has illustrated more than 80 books, created several animated shorts for Sesame Street, has had his artwork exhibited in several countries, and has been awarded 13 gold and 14 silver medals from the American Society of Illustrators. And if that wasn't enough, he recently formed a foundation for picture book art in Switzerland. Welcome, Adrian. Hello. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, in your work, you use elements of uh, fantasy and caricature, the and a style that's uh, very distinct. And I, I, I wondered, uh, how would you classify your style? Well, uh, as you mentioned, I have done books, uh, but also paintings, or I worked for the for the press, for the New York Times, or uh, the Atlantic Magazine. Uh, I did many cover, cover stories for them, and. So I, I would say I adapt uh, to the to the venue somehow, mm -hmm. and but uh, I would say that my style is to transform reality with imagination. I would say I'm closer to. Uh, well, I love beautiful uh, paintings and artwork, but I'm closer to writers. I would say, uh, and that's. Uh, for the last 50 years, a direction that uh, was taken by uh, some great graphic artists uh, in Europe and in the States. I would say, uh, evidently, I admire uh, Steinberg, I would name him, and uh, uh, Glazer and, and Quast of the Perspin uh, here in the States. Uh, in France, André François or Alain Le Foll and evidently for books, uh, Sendak and Tommy Ungerer, and someone which uh, people don't really know, but was great, uh, someone called Domenico Gnoli, who died when he was 36 in 1970, after doing, uh, having done two picture books, uh, one of them, Orest or the Art of Smiling, and uh, uh, he did incredible, beautifully drawn reportage for magazines like Fortune or Holiday at the time, and is known more now for uh, the large paintings uh, in the last part of his life that were uh, details of clothing, uh, shirts, buttons, and which are great. I prefer the loose drawings of corridas and, and, but I have to name him because I would say he was one of the people, one of the reasons for me to come to New York in 65. Yeah, I was very interested to learn uh, about uh, your experiences with childhood development uh, and uh, your work with the child psychologist, uh, Jean Piaget. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, um, Two things. Uh, my childhood was unlike, unlike uh, Sendak, uh, very normal and very happy. Uh, I was uh, living in, in Lausanne, Switzerland, and I was going to the countryside with my parents many times, and uh, uh, I would spend uh, summers uh, near Lausanne in the countryside in an incredible garden, which I call the Garden of Eden, and uh, where I would learn everything about uh, flowers, birds, bugs, uh, little animals, and, uh, and I remember that in this, and I would, this really influenced my vision uh, as an artist in a way that I have uh, the rhythm of the 
human uh, geometry of the roofs of the farms in my blood. And uh, also I remember that my father would be able to uh, sit for an hour in a forest for a picnic and have a mouse coming to eat in his hand. Uh, I mean, he was really taming uh, little animals and big monsters as well. Mm -hmm. He was a very, very liberal uh, minister, Protestant minister, and uh, Protestant ministers have a very different way of saying the world than American Protestant. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a very happy uh, childhood going to learning uh, Greek and Latin and German uh, uh, and being kind of born in school. And when I was 18, I decided uh, not to go to university. My father wanted to, me to be a, or I would have wished uh, that I would be a diplomat. And uh, my wife, Rita Marshall, the great art director, is laughing at me when uh, I, I mentioned that memory of being a diplomat. She said, well, you are too brutal. Uh, <laughs> and which I think great diplomats have to be brutal once in a while, just to assert their position. But um, I decided at 18, I would stop my uh, very classical studies and uh, I would uh, go to a graphic design studio. And uh, I told that to my father and my mother separately. And uh, uh, each, on, each one of them had very exact, very similar answer. They say, well, we know you well enough uh, to uh, know that if you choose that career, you'll do it well. And I had no problem at all with them uh, changing completely the course of my life and going to a graphic design studio doing design advertising. And it was a great apprenticeship uh, when I was 19, uh, I, a year into the studio and I had my own clients, which was a publishing house and uh, I was their art director uh, of their books and uh, long days, 14 hour every day uh, working on my, uh, in the studio and for my own, uh, own staff. And uh, I <coughs> moved in to Paris when I was 21 uh, I was not drawing, and uh, that's a question that people say, well, I mean, when you we see what you do, uh, you must have been drawing all, all your life. No, not true. I started when I was 20, 23, and um, I worked as a graphic designer and art director, freelance art director for large advertising agencies, design magazines, uh, and then decided I want, uh, since I'm a storyteller, that's uh, something which is a characteristic of my work probably. And uh, I wanted to do picture books at the time. They were very, I mean, compared to what the production of millions and millions and billions of books today, uh, there were few books being done and uh, uh, maybe with more spirit that uh, what we can see now. And uh, I decided I learned about Sendak and Unger and again, Domenico Dioli and, uh, uh, and the Pushpin evidently um, when I was in Paris and there was an American bookstore, I, can say, I could see magazines and I could see uh, books there. And I came to the state to do books, which took some time. And uh, it took me a year. And uh, uh, fun story, I'd been uh, introduced by Tommy Ungerer to Ursula Nordstrom, the famous monster looking like Orson Welles in uh, A Man of All Seasons. Mm -hmm. And um, she received me very nicely. We spent an hour, I, I couldn't speak basically a word of English at the time. And uh, but we met for an hour and she said, okay, 
I'm going to call for me to thank him and uh, we'll, I'll have a manuscript within weeks for you. And uh, it was heaven. I mean, it was really being you know, uh, the idea of working with a great editor. And, uh, and um, I was leaving the room and opening the door when she said, oh, by the way, are you doing hand separations? And uh, I say, yes, I've done a few for book covers, and uh, but I want my very first picture book to be in full color. And she said, well, you know, Tommy and Sendak are still doing hand separations, and uh, so you should be ready to uh, for, for that way of working. And I said, well, I'm sorry, my first book will be in full color. We never spoke again. <laughs> <laughs> And that was one of the very big, stupid mistake I, I made in my life. When you are young, you feel you can convince other people of uh, with more power than you have. And um, so I was very interested in the picture books, why? And you mentioned Piaget. Um, because I feel that when, uh, at least in my case, when you, I remember my uh, my youth, I, I would say that I, I was, I had a great stepmother. My mother died when I was born and uh, she was a great storyteller. And uh, we would play, uh, some, do something that few people do and maybe psychoanalysts should recommend to parents who have difficult children. It's to invent plays. I mean, you take a subject and uh, for half an hour, uh, you, you play the different characters of, uh, of what you are going to, the story you're going to tell. And my mother would leave uh, me by myself on the couch and uh, go to the kitchen, leave the door half open and uh, listen to, and, and sometimes laugh loud to what I was saying. But I was, able to go on telling my own stories already when I was, I don't know, five, six, seven. And uh, I love the idea that an adult can try to remember the emotions, the fantasy, the dreams. I mean, when you're a child, as you know, uh, well, first you know you don't know much. That's one thing, if you are clever. But also you realize that uh, many things maybe are possible. And that's a cliche, but it's true. I mean, uh, as an adult, you are uh, confined in, in uh, other people's ideas and other uh, people's jobs and uh, social relationships. So that's why I love uh, picture books. And also, they are cheaper than to do a film somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, I experienced that um, and when I was doing animation. But, and um, so my first books were done with a small publisher called Harlan Quist. And he was kind of a Don Quixote uh, of publishing, they were doing daring things uh, that other larger publishing wouldn't do. And, um, so my first books, uh, the, uh, my very first book was called The Endless Party. I did it in New York when I came in, uh, in uh, 1965. I was 24 and I worked on that uh, Endless Party, which is the story of Noah, Noah's Ark, very like. Uh, Noah is inviting animals on the beach for a big party, and uh, I, I uh, have no presence of God uh, at all in the story. It's just a big cruise somehow, and the, the animals are in, go on the on the ark. They play games, get bored, take over. Uh, they become pirates on the on the boat, and. Uh, it ends well. Anyway, this and two books I did with you, the great playwright Eugene Ionesco, story number one and story number two. 
uh, were very, very successful. They had many uh, translations and many reprints and uh, it was great launching somehow. But also people said, well, these are not books for children. And that made me <clears throat> kind of enraged uh, because I, well, I questioned myself. And by chance, there was a piece uh, in 1970 in the New York Times Magazine about uh, Jean Piaget, who is a, was a Swiss uh, psychologist or uh, etymologist, I would say, and uh, working with children to understand adults. And uh, that was really the line. And I say, oh, great. I didn't know him at all. But I say, he's Swiss. I'm Swiss. Uh, let's go to Geneva and ask him if my books are really wrong. Uh, I mean, if I don't speak for, for, uh, uh, for children somehow. So we met and he told me, well, uh, First, he needed time to look at the books to, to answer my questions. But what would have been, a, I felt, a 30-minute uh, visit last for, lasted for hours. And, uh, and we got along really well at my big surprise. <laughs> and at the end of the day, he said, you know, I've studied so many time drawings by children, but I never thought about wondering how children read adults pictures. So can we work together? That was the, the way we started eight months of collaboration uh, in Switzerland, uh, studying with children in Swiss classes and with the team of his uh, assistants. I would meet him uh, every 10 days or so in his garden and talk about uh, the work we had done and uh, about plants exotic plants, uh, plants that he wanted to grow in Geneva without much success in his garden. And um, he, we should remember that the importance of this collaboration for me, because uh, in the year 2000, when Time Magazine uh, had a special issue about the giants of the last century in the field of psychology, uh, they had two great names which were, which were Freud and Piaget. Mm. And uh, so it was such an easy collaboration uh, because we, we were coming from such a different point of view <laughs> somehow <laughs> or past. And uh, when I showed him all the drawings at the very end, uh, uh, he said, well, everything is fine and uh, I agree with it. And, uh, and in a shy way he said, can I write a foreword for it, for the book? And evidently it was uh, great news. And uh, what we did was um, to, I had written a storyline uh, and it was shown to, to kids and without saying my own sketches, they would have to do their own interpretation of my story. And, or I would show my sketches and they had to write the story for, without seeing the storyline, my storyline. And we were very surprised because many times, quite a few times, the drawings of the children who were five at the time, uh, trying to explain what, uh, uh, nature of uh, phenomena, where well, what cloud is, what the sun, what is shadow, what is uh, what is thunder, rain, snow. Uh, their interpretation, their drawings were very similar to my own sketches. So that was the answer that Piaget uh, gave me that I was right and I should continue to do books. Okay, and going back to your uh, your uh, start in uh, illustration, so you were largely self-taught, correct? I'm self-taught, yeah, completely. Yeah, it, I, I it, never went to a school. Art and school. so, uh, yeah, so how did you how did you learn to draw? You just uh, through books or or practice or what? I would say that when I was uh, 13, 14, 
uh, I was watching uh, in, on the streets of Switzerland, uh, the posters. I mean, there are more posters in Switzerland than any place. And I would love the Swiss German great graphic uh, design uh, artists like Hoffman and Müller Brockman and Rodomat Gerstner, but, uh, and, and Piatti and Lopin. I would say Lopin was my favorite. So I was learning from the street. And um, and also from a wonderful magazine that doesn't exist anymore um, called Graphis. It was published in Zurich by Walter Herdeck, who was a graphic designer as well. And he was the only one at the time, and still now, I think, uh, to uh, mix fine art, so-called so -called fine art. We'll talk, we can talk about commercial and fine art these days, uh, um, with advertising, with uh, uh, comic strip, with cartoon, with photography. It was an incredible bi-monthly magazine that many, many people in the uh, advertising, publishing world and, and uh, artists were sharing. So when you had a piece in uh, on the cover of the magazine or a piece inside of the magazine, uh, you were launched uh, in the world somehow. Uh, I, I was very lucky to have uh, early uh, cover and, and, and pieces in Graphics Magazine. That was my school. And uh, more than museums, more than uh, uh, you know, fine art, uh, museums uh, in Switzerland. Some of them are beautiful and great, mostly in the German part of Switzerland. And uh, I would say that, and I experimented that in Paris uh, in 75, when I was 34, when I had a, a show in Le Louvre, uh, my first retrospective in Le Louvre, uh, in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs. That was, at the time, the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. There was no modern art museum in Paris. And the, the man who uh, was the head of that museum, Francois Maté, uh, was incredible. I don't know any curator today who would be uh, have such a large vision of art saying, well, uh, mixing uh, Pica uh, Picasso's or Matisse, uh, uh, of Picasso, of Dubuffet, of uh, Hockney. Hockney had uh, his first retrospective just before mine. Mm. And, and he was mixing this great artist with uh, graphic artist, with uh, mm. uh, Follon, with André Francois, with the Pushpin, had a show there. And he said, well, there are good and bad pictures, nothing else. And uh, uh, he was very, very interested in what he called graphic artists because he felt they were, we were, in touch with social and political reality much more than uh, what, the, what uh, the artists that are called fine artists. And uh, today I still share that approach in a way that uh, I feel that fine art is more commercial these days and than many illustration can be. And the world commercial art for uh, Rockwell or for Steinberg or for the great uh, uh, artists uh, and illustrators uh, is totally wrong. It's still in the mind of galleries and museums. It's changing. It's changing. And the reason I created uh, my Maître de l'Imaginaire in French, which is Masters of Imagination Foundation, is to collect originals of some of the best uh, artists who have done picture books, but not only, and uh, to place them in great places in great museums uh, and uh, show them and document and archive them.
Um, uh, when did you get started in uh, animation as a, as a serious... Uh, Doing animation? Well, I, was, I had done a book uh, with uh, Sesame Street mm -hmm. uh, and uh, called Being Green uh, by Joe Rapoto, who was the music director. And uh, I, at that time, I was able to do, I think, the only book in... Uh, in, for Sesame Street that doesn't use the Muppets, which I loved. I loved the Muppets. I loved uh, the Muppets. And uh, and uh, one of my regrets in my career is not to have been associated closer to Sesame Street, uh, mm -hmm. if they be in different kind of life. And one of my uh, characters called Yok Yok almost came to, uh, to Sesame Street. Uh, John Stone, who was the original producer of the show, uh, who decided of the format of short sequences, uh, had come to Switzerland and loved what I was, uh, the films, the little films I was doing with that character for Swiss and French TV, and and said, oh, I'm, I want that on Sesame Street. It would have been the very, very first time that they would have bought something outside of their program. Uh, they, they asked me to do, and I, I wanted to do animation. So it was a way to uh, communicate in a different way. And I did uh, quite, in, I mean, depending on the budget, evidently some intricate paper cutout uh, animation, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which was one of the traditional ways of doing animation. And uh, I did uh, Bain Green, like I mentioned, uh, with my own characters and uh, completely with no Muppets, no, no reference to the program. And it was a huge success, the book. And uh, after that, I did uh, advertise some advertising, some uh, medical films, uh, ecological and environmental films as well. Uh, looking back, what artwork or, or work that you've done are you most proud of? Well, in books, uh, there is one book I really like called Ashes, Ashes, uh, which is uh, a story of someone coming like in Stravinsky, Stravinsky's and Ramu's story of the soldier Come is, is coming back home after being far away at war. And uh, he uh, is accepting, and he's coming to New England, and uh, he's accepting to be invited by three strange characters to go to a new country and start his life uh, in exile or, or, or as an immigrant uh, in a new, in a nowhere land country. And he realized soon that uh, is not the only one to be there. And uh, with a, a group of friends, uh, they realize that they do the same mistakes they were doing <laughs> before moving to the new country. Mm -hmm. Ashes, Ashes, that's my best book, I think. I just want to ask you one, one last question. Um, so you've received numerous awards uh, bestowed by arts organizations and your colleagues. And I was wondering uh, why you think that uh, your work resonates so well uh, among others. Well, I've been honored by, in the States, by my peers, uh, which was very grateful, you know. And uh, so that was one reason to be proud of it. All right, well, that's all the time we have uh, for now at the end. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, for more information, check out ATN's website at atndelazette.com and our own websites, nrm.org, illustrationhistory.org, and visit the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies at rockwellcenter.org. As always, don't forget to subscribe to be notified for the latest content. Uh, this has been a production of the Norman Rockwell Museum. To watch the video of this podcast or to see the images referenced in this episode, please visit nrm.org slash podcast. New episodes from the Illustrator Studio are released every Monday. 
For questions or comments, please email us at podcast at nrm.org. <laughs>